Right. Okay. So today we're having a bake sale. Why are we having a bake sale? For the youth. Are the youth important? Do we love them? Do we want them to go and get fired up some more? Do we want them to change the world? Well, then buy a brownie. <laughs> <laughs> or two. <laughs> so it'll be after, after the service today. And then the Ladies of Liberty are going to a painting party today. So we're going to meet at the church to carpool. And we're going to leave here, be here at 415. And we're driving away at 430. Okay? So, you know, ladies, ladies, you know how we are. Okay. I can't even... Yell at anybody because I'm like that too. Okay. Um, don't forget our prayer opportunities this week. We always have revival prayer uh, Tuesdays, 5 to 6.30, and then all in prayer by the phone at 7.14. So we start here, and then we continue on on the phone. Um, and Friday from 10 to noon, family prayer right here at the church. Our Wednesday night classes, Beth is going to teach this week. <laughs> Okay, Beth is missing in her chair, but she's not missing. There she is, see? And so she is going to have, we're going to have a real-life class, and she's going to be talking about thinking and acting like Jesus. And the Limitless Youth are um, meeting on Wednesday night. The ones that have signed up to go deeper in God are going deeper in God. It's amazing. And so I am, I'm proud of those that are coming out additionally on a Wednesday night so they can get closer to the Lord. That's awesome. Okay, the Limitless Youth is going to have a snack shack and a car wash while we watch the movie. Such a deal. Okay, so we can chow down. And we can get our cars looking nice and pretty. And all we have to do is give a donation. And whatever donation you give, someone is matching it. So it's double yay. Yeah. Yay. Yay. And so um, somebody put that on, uh, God put that on somebody's heart. And so we, listen, I, I guess we got it in this church that we care about the next generations. So we're going to sow seeds into them. And... Um, Okay, if you want to hire a youth, which I am doing, and um, you can hire them and they'll come to your house and do whatever nonsense that you have, which I have a lot. And we're having a garage sale for them uh, as well on May 19th. So set your stuff aside. My garage is starting to fill up with stuff for their garage sale. So I'll be happy when it comes because I'm ready to get rid of this stuff that I've been collecting. Okay. All right, let's do our scripture prayer and declaration. Okay. Psalms 1, 11, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Father, we bring our nation's president before you. We pray that the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him and his cabinet. We ask you to give him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We declare that the most high God who put him in office will supply all that he and his advisors need to meet the challenges of each day. And may your praise endure forever in the United States. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Such an important declaration. Um, I know that all of you know what happened this weekend in Syria. And, um, you know, we pray for all those. We pray for all the people. I think sometimes we forget to pray for those who are also the perpetrators. And listen, they're nasty. I mean, if we look at them and look at their decision-making, it is a hard thing. But how many of you know that all of us are made in God's image and in his likeness? And we don't know what happened in those people's lives. But we need to lift up everybody before the Lord and pray that God will reach their hearts. Amen? So...
just adding that. Okay. So I want to talk to you for a minute about the offering. How many of you know that God's word is truth? Okay, say it back to me. God's word word is truth. truth. All right. (laughs) Thank you. So the seed of his word begins to bring faith into your life. When you get a hold of God's word and it begins to bring life to you, you can look at it like a, a love letter written exactly to you. And when you have it applied to your life, you're going to experience God in different dimensions than you ever have before. So his purpose and his design and his will will start coming alive to you because it's all written in God's word. And so Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing. And hearing what though? The word word of God. So if we're not putting the word inside of us and if we're not speaking it out, if we're not paying attention to what God is releasing, then we're not going to have our faith built and then we wonder why we don't walk in faith. And so we've got to keep the word in front of us and we've got to keep speaking it out. So faith has to come and it comes by sowing his seed in our heart like a seed, So our heart starts responding to that seed and bringing forth the harvest called faith. Oh, that's nice. (laughs) Some kind of music outside. Okay. (laughs) When it it has ground for it to grow in, it brings multiplication. And so faith comes not because it's already evident, because we have hope that it's going to be evident. Amen? And so we have to stop listening to men and start listening to God and agreeing with God. How many of you know that even doctors are not the creators of heaven and earth? And we are glad for that. Um, But the word of God has our answer. The word of God, he created us. He created earth. He created all of us with the words of his mouth. So when we get in agreement with the words of our mouth, things shift. So today we're going to... Plant our seed, and as we plant our seed, we are agreeing with God and what his word says about this seed. Amen? So ushers, wait on the people, and we're going to make this declaration. In order for me, yeah, say it. In order for me to receive my miracle, I have to read his word. But when I hide God's word in my heart, I can receive what it says about me. I don't have to be worried about what men say. I am only worried about what God says. So with this seed, I release the power that is in the kingdom of God into my life, into my situation, into my family, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk to you today, we we started last week about talking about living like more than a conqueror. And so we have to live the way that God said we can live, and yet most of us are living far below what God has released to us, but we're going to have to change our minds. Look at somebody say, you're going to change your mind. Yep. So we are built with the blueprint of heaven inside of us, and we have to be aware that even though he has designed us to always win, we're in a fight. Now, maybe you know we're in a fight. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just the way that it is. However, that should not bring us fear because we can have faith in the word of God because he has designed us and put inside of us his seed of victory. So we're always going to win. Look at somebody and say, you're always going to win. Okay, so we are the ones that are equipped to take back what the enemy has stolen or is in the process of trying to steal. And so we are going to bring generations back to the important things. I declare it. We're bringing them back to worship. Worship of God and God alone. Amen? We are bringing them back to surrender to him. We are bringing them back to hunger for him. We are going to bring generation after generation after generation back to morality. Words people don't want to hear about. Back to holiness. And therefore back to wholeness. 
Amen. And so we're not seeking after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are going to be seeking after us when we do those things. When those things are in our life and we are obeying what God says about it, then signs and wonders chase after those kind of people. And so we're going to be those people. We're going to be those folks. And so how many of you know that the, the generations, if you look at them just on the surface right now, they look like they might be in trouble. I mean, generate, you know, how many of you have heard the word entitlement? I mean, that's because they, they, have, they have named them the entitlement generation. They speak word curses out, out over them all the time, and they act like they're entitled. I mean, they do. It's the truth. But they just don't know who they are. The problem isn't that they have entitlement. The problem is nobody's telling them the truth about who they are. And nobody maybe didn't tell you the truth about who you are. Because you are not a needy person that has no remedy. You are a child of God who has already been given the ability to have victory. You just have to choose it. Amen? Amen? And so... We have to be more than conquerors. Well, what is more than a conqueror? I'll tell you what, and we learned this last week, I hope. A champion. A champion is more than a conqueror. A conqueror is known for the battles that they win. Yay, they win battles. That's great. But a champion is defined by the winner that he is. Just a winner, a mindset. Accepting that as a new normal, not just a one-time experience of winning, but always winning. Amen? So everyone, however, needs it modeled for them. So for those who are hungry for Jesus and those who are hungry for God, those who are hungry for what he does and, and, and they don't apologize for who he is and what he has done in their lives, then other people can watch your life, and by watching your life, they can begin to align. And so the Bible defines who the generations are and who we are. So let's go to Romans 8, 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. In other words, it won't stop the tactic of the enemy, but God will justify you. God will come into you, the situation that you are facing, and he will stop the enemy on your behalf. Who is it who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Just that alone, knowing that Jesus is on the throne right now praying for us. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation separate you? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, no matter what we face, no matter what your circumstance is, no matter what is going on in your life, in all of these things, you are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? So more than conquerors, champions. So last week we started talking about characteristics of champions, and we learned that conquerors, they, they live differently because they are living for something bigger than themselves. They've got other people on their mind. They stay ready for change to happen, knowing that they have to transition, and the only way to really transition is from glory to glory, in his presence, from glory to glory. And they see what other people don't see. And so... Elisha saw heavenly armies. Elisha prayer, prayed for his servant, and his eyes were open to see the same. Elisha knows that victory is on the way, and we should be like Elisha. Amen? Amen. So that really did happen. So it's obvious that champions see beyond the obvious. Okay, so we have to get used to living with the awareness that God is on the inside of us. And always on our side. Champions dream God dreams. 
Champions don't stop with natural dreams. They dream God dreams. It's bigger than them. And so why, if this is what the word says, then why isn't victory our everyday experience? Right? Okay, so this is the big question everybody has. Well, but I believed God and X, Y, Z. Okay, so why isn't it happening? Well, we need to change our mindset. We all need to change our mindset. From natural thinking to thinking that agrees with God. It, you are capable of this. This is what Jesus said. Matthew 21, 21. Um, Jesus answered them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to a mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. So I have a question for you. How many of you cast a mountain into the sea this week? Right? Mm. Okay. And Jesus, also, is it possible? Yes. Did he, was this Jesus talking? If you look it up in your Bible, it should be read. Jesus said that you can speak to the mountain and it will be removed into the sea. So is this possible for Christians? It is. Okay. And Jesus also said this, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Amen? Amen. All right, I got some hands on that one. Okay, so did he say that you'll do it by hoping that you'll get it? No. He said, whatever things you ask for in prayer, believing, you got to add the believing part to it, and you will receive. He didn't say maybe sometimes. He said if you believe it, you're going to have it. And so we sometimes skip over this scripture because it kind of puts some responsibility back on us, doesn't it? I mean, God already said you can have it. He's already paid the price through Jesus Christ, his son. But he said you have to pray and you have to believe when you pray and then you're going to have it. This is how champions live. Okay? You have to conquer your own mindset by renewing it with the word so you can find the champion that's inside you. You're not going to find your champion if you're not a conqueror. The first thing you have to conquer is you. Amen. Amen. So our brain needs to align itself with the truth of God's word, which supersedes the natural. And so if we're concentrating on whatever is happening around us, instead of what God's promises are, then we get beat down and we lose the victory. And then we lose the victory mindset. Okay? So this is, Paul was a champion. How many remember Paul? He used to be Saul. But he sure changed his mind. He changed his mind from persecuting Christians to becoming one. And then, <laughs> oh, the big transition. And then he taught everybody else how to be one. And this is what he said in Romans it's um, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I appeal to you. This man is desperate for us to get this. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your body, presenting all your members and, fa and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, yeah. devoted, consecrated and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. He's like, this is just, should be normal for every Christian. You should just change your mind, but I'm appealing to you to believe this, that this is how you align yourself. And then he goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, <laughs> changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitude. Everybody grab your head. All right, grab a hold of it and say, you have new ideas and new attitudes. They are coming to me today. Amen. And he said, then you're going to prove for yourself what is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God. Even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. So that means every person 
has wonderful, good, acceptable things that God has pre-planned for you in your life. Isn't that good news? That's part of the good news of the gospel. Yay. Okay, so we know we have to transform, and we're going to transform into champions as we renew our mind and not go into whatever, however the winds blow in our life. You know, whenever you're just tossed around by everything that's going on, you're not going to be steady. You're not going to take positional authority. You're not going to be a conqueror, and you're not going to be a champion, but you can be. And God has designed you to be, but you have to make choices. And so we can't be defeated in our own mind. So this is what the enemy does. He'll try to give us a situation where it is familiar to our family line. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, okay, Dad, I love you and you're in heaven, so I guess you're okay with this. My dad operated in a spirit of fear. He was always afraid, but it was money. It's always about money. It drove me crazy. Well, I better not say that out of my mouth. It didn't drive me crazy. However, it bothered me that he was always worried about money. Okay. And so it, that was a big deal all of the days of his life. He had to fight against that fear. Well, that tries to go from generation to generation, and you start, well, I don't, I don't really worry about money. But it was hard for me to come to that conclusion that I didn't have to worry about money. But the way that I learned not to worry about money was because God proved his love towards me in a natural, through a natural means, but a supernatural way. And so most of you know the story that this lady gave me a, a diamond ring. And I was, it was a very nice diamond ring. And so I asked her if it was real. And so she was like, oh, Lord have mercy. And so she said, yes. I said, I can't take that. And she said, well, you have to. Because if you don't take it, you're stopping my blessing. And this is going to release the blessing to you. And I said, it is going to release the blessing to me. I had just heard that if you give, you shall receive. And I was trying to decide if it was real or not. And it was real. And so I immediately received outrageous. But it made me an outrageous giver. Because I knew this. I don't, if I don't hold on to money, money will come to me because money can come through me. Amen? So that is thinking like a champion. That is conquering the fear of loss. That is conquering uh, poverty mentality. Amen? Okay, so the passage of translation says this in Romans 8.37. That we already read this, but I'm reading it in the Passion Translation. Even in all these things, we triumph over them all, for God has made us to be more than conquerors through him, and his, has demonstrated his love in our glorious victory over everything. Our glorious victory in everything because of love. So, because loving him completely opens up the door to who we are and what we can be. Amen? Okay, so here's what, here's our new characteristic of a champion for today. Champions do what other people don't. Champions do what other people don't. So we're going to look at Gideon. Yeah, so this time, the Midianites are the enemy, and they are on a rampage. There were thousands of them, thousands of them. And so they're coming against the Israelites. But there were also thousands of Israelites to fight back. And so this became an issue to God. He knew that if the enemy would come against them and that they would win by the thousands, that they would end up thinking that they had something to do with the win. And then pride would be the real problem and pride would actually win. So it was easy to tone down a little bit according to God's wisdom and the way that he looks at things. So God comes into play and starts talking to Gideon, and this is what he says. You have too many men. Does this make any sense in the natural? No. You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her, announce now to the people this. 
anybody who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. <laughs> so 22,000 people went home. This was a bunch of shaken people. They <laughs> were like, they were scared, okay? So fear was present. Now, how many of you think that fear might have been present in the other ones too? I mean, they're fair. <laughs> yeah, okay. But fear had gripped the minds of 22,000. Fear had gotten a hold of them to the point that they were going to let fear determine what they were going to do. And so, but 10,000 people remained because the idea of victory was greater to them than the idea of fear. Okay, so they had a conquering mindset. Do you see that? Okay, but God's still not happy. So he says, there's still too many of them. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you. Thanks, God. This is great, you know? If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So God is telling Gideon, you better do it my way. You better listen to me. It's not going to make any sense to your senses. So Gideon took the men down to the water, and there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from the ones who kneel down to drink. And 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths, and all the rest got down to their knees to drink. Now, can you picture this? Okay, so either they're grabbing the water... And they're bringing it up, they're like, and, and they're bringing it up to their mouth. Or they're just like, <laughs> you know. Did you like that? Oh, that's great. I, don't do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, now, out of those two groups, if I was God, I would have picked the guys who cupped their hands and were still looking around. At least they were paying attention, right? The guys are acting like meatball are, are just like, they're, they're like, they don't pay no attention to nothing going around. And so the Lord says, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other men go home, each to their own place. Lord, have mercy. I'd be like, say what? You know? And he might have, it's just not written here, but he might have been, there might have been an argument going on, except for God already told him, you got to do it my way. So the people took provisions in their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and they retained those 300 men. Oh, yay, 300 against thousands, that's awesome. So <laughs> God picks the most illogical people on purpose. Think about it. How will he get the most glory? How is he going to be seen for the God that rescued the Israelites against the enemy? And how will it be more evident to them than 300 people who weren't paying attention? Right? And so he wants all the glory. He wants you to win, and he's given you the victory. He's already written your victory in his book. Everything that you face, he has a victory assigned to it. Oh. All right. Everything that you're facing, let's make it. Everything that you're facing, God has already assigned victory to the end of it. He's like... Okay, if you only saw what I see, you would know you're already victorious. You see, the victory is assigned to this challenge. So you can be not only a conqueror, but you can be a champion. Yeah, right. Amen. And so the rest of the story is so long, I won't go into it. But anyway, I'll tell you the end of it. So... He divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. Perfect. This is great. No machine guns, you know, no arrow. Torches and pitchers. What in the world? Okay. 
And then he says, uh, look at me and do likewise, watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you'll do as I do. And when I blow the trumpet, I and all the men who are with me, then you also blow the, blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Oh. So the people are going to have to go along with this. You got 300 people that are going to go along with this weirdness, okay? And so... Gideon and the 300 men who were with them came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets, and they broke the pitchers, and then you could see the fire, and the three companies blew, uh, okay, and they had the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand, and they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. Well, that's a cool way to win a battle, isn't it? So when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companions throughout the whole camp, and the army fled. Now, why did they cry the sword of the Lord and of Gideon? Now, we know that it was the sword of the Lord that would win this battle because this makes no sense. Okay, so we know God is in the midst of this, and he has already written victory onto this challenge. He's already got it, okay? And then it's all against natural odds. But why the sword of Gideon? I'll tell you why. Because if you back up some in the word of God and we first find Gideon, we find Gideon hiding in fear in a wine press away from these people. So now... Something has happened to Gideon. You see, Gideon had to face his own fear. He had to get past his own issues. And when he did, and he did through relationship with God, he became more than just a conqueror. He became a champion that God could trust to lead other conquerors. And so when they were crying the word, the word of the Lord and the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, they were declaring it wasn't just God who won the battle, but it was Gideon who won the battle with God. Ahead of time. In his own life. To live it out in front of other generations. Oh, God. Somebody get this. Thank you. God is looking for those people who won't argue with him about the way he wants to do things, but that will just agree with him and go ahead and do it even if it is outrageous. And that was outrageous. Truth? Truth. Okay, so, but there is a champion inside of you. So look at somebody and say, there's a champion inside of you. You people are staying awake today. I'm going to make you talk to each other. Okay. <laughs> Champions operate differently. Okay, so the next point is this. Champions operate with a commanding anointing. And that means this. They talk like other people don't talk. Champions talk like other people don't talk. Okay? So anybody ever heard of Joshua? Oh, yeah. That sounds just like my dad. He... He is famous for the Battle of Jericho, you know. I mean, you know, the, the Israelites are finally going to make it into the promised land, except for there's these huge walls and a bunch of enemies. And so Joshua hears from God, and he says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk around the city for six days on the seventh day. We're going to shout. And that makes sense. And the walls are going to fall down. All right? <laughs> and so, but he had learned something. Through that experience, the power of words. Amen? And so those walls did not have a chance against the instructions of the Lord. And the instruction of the Lord is, release something from your mouth, and the enemy can't win against it. And so now, Joshua has got this under his belt, and there arises another situation. So five kings have come together 
and they've decided they're going to come against the Gibeonites. Now, the Gibeonites are, you know, in close territory, and they had fooled Joshua by coming to him, and they put on their old clothes, and they made themselves look like they've, they've been walking forever and ever, and then they said, I need you to come into covenant with me. And the whole reason why was because they knew God was on his side. And so they're just like faking him out to get him to make a covenant because these people recognize that covenant means that the victory that he has is the victory that they're going to experience and that whatever armies that they have are now their armies too and whatever tactical ideas that they have, weird as they are, they're going to benefit from them. And so they trick him into doing it and Joshua doesn't check in with God on that one. And and so he says, okay, yeah, let's enter into covenant. And they entered into covenant where they became one. And now the Gibeonites are under attack by five armies and five kings. And so they're like, knock, knock, knock. Hey, guess what? Remember that covenant we made? We are in big time trouble. Amen. Okay, so um, the Gibeon Gibeonites lived in a territory which was actually quite wealthy and doing well. And they didn't want to lose what they had, but they knew they needed him in their midst. Okay, so he came prepared. Say, Joshua came prepared. Now, this is how he came prepared. Joshua 10, 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, now this is Joshua, this is not God. Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of, yeah, Ajalon. Thank you. All right. So how was he prepared? He was prepared to use the words of his mouth to stop the sun and the moon. What? Oh, my goodness. Who is this Joshua? Who is this Joshua? He's the one who followed Moses around and stayed as close to the anointing as he could get. He was the one that sat outside the tent of meeting when everybody else was afraid to be next to Moses when he was glowing after he went to the mountain. He was, he was the one that was told by God to shout the walls down and he had gotten that victory. He was the one that in another instance, he held his spear up against the enemy. And as long as he held his spear up, they won. So he held it up the whole time and they won the victory. This is no lightweight. This is Joshua who is more than a conqueror. This is Joshua who has become a champion. He is so much of a champion that he goes, he surveys the situation and he looks at what is going on and he goes, hmm, we're going to need sunlight here. In order for us to win against their armies, we got to have some sunlight. And the sun was starting to go down. So he just said, no, you're not going to go down, sun. I have authority over the elements. And he goes, sun, you stay right there. And moon, you stay right there. And for 24 hours, and this is backed up even by what, however they count time. They can't find time for 24 hours. You know why? Because for a day, God honored Gideon's command. Oh, my God. That just gave me chills. Because we serve the same God. We just don't think the same way. Our minds got to be renewed. We, we got to be like, wait a minute. That man stopped the sun and the moon. What have I done? If I stopped the sun and moon yesterday, I mean, no. I didn't do it, but I probably could have. And so it says it, it, was, it was an outrageous way of doing things. But how did he win? By the words of his mouth. Hello? By the words of his mouth. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the people had revenge upon their enemies. 
That's God. Who got glory for that? God. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now, here was the amazing revelation of that. God didn't decide how to win that battle. Joshua did. Exactly. God didn't say, every other time we've read about this and we're learning, God told them what to do. He goes, shout, okay? He said, speak. He did, right? He said, wait till they lap. He was the orchestrator of it all. But this time is different. This time, Joshua goes, hmm, this is what needs to happen. And he says that he says to the Lord, I need this moon over here to stand still, sun over here to stand still. And it says that the Lord responded to his request. This is when you have enough relationship with God that you know you don't have to beg him for stuff, but God is up in heaven. I mean, like if you saw how cool God was in heaven, it says that he dances and he sings over us. Well, I think he also high fives over us. And so, like, when, when Joshua's like, hey, sun, stop, and moon, stop, God is up there going, ha, ha, ha. He's probably high-fiving everybody. I mean, he's got a big hand. Maybe he did it with one slap. I don't know. So, but, I mean, he's like, finally, 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 somebody's got it. He's identified with my DNA to the point where he is saying, stop, stop. The elements have to come into alignment. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm honoring this guy. He has got my heart. He has got my abilities, and he knows it. Oh, yeah. The creator of the sun and the moon listened to Joshua for the win. You should write that down. Just saying. Okay. I wonder if when we get to heaven, that victory was on the end of our challenge, but we didn't see it. I wonder how many things that he has wrote down for us so that we could obtain it, but we missed it because we're not acting like God has told us to act. And so... God has created his children to win for the victory. Okay, so champions dare to speak like no one else dares to speak. I mean, people think you're crazy. You start commanding elements and they think you're crazy. So this, this week I was talking to somebody and they were talking about, if I told you his name, everybody would probably know it, but you'll have opinions about him, so I won't tell you who it was. So he is an older, wonderful, spiritual man of God. And he was mentoring a younger, wonderful, spiritual man of God. And so they were talking and communicating, and his wife called and said, you got to get out of there. There is a tornado heading straight for the building you're in, straight for you. Get out of there. And the younger man of God saw the older man of God, just get up, go to the window and say, you, funnel cloud, you're going to go right back up where you came from. Just dissipate. And, the, and it did. It just sucked right back up in the air. He saw it with his own eyes. And he's like, and he said, the thing what, now, we, listen, we've done similar things, at least most of us here have. We've stopped storms. I've stopped rain. I mean, we know this principle. But he said the difference was, was that the authority in which he spoke was so thick that it, it was, he could hardly stand. Because the authority, there was, he was just telling the elements just like Joshua did that day. What they were going to do, and they were going to do it. 
I mean, I prayed and told rain to stop, and it stopped, and I prayed and told rain to stop, and it didn't. But it's okay. I'm practicing, and I'm learning, and we're all in process, but this is a man of God who has decided that whatever he says, God is going to back. And so champions live like this. Champions think like this. Champions do things like this. They expect God to move on their behalf, and God moves on their behalf. Amen? And so we have to take courage like a champion to walk into uncharted territory. That means we're not going to please everybody. We're not going to convince everybody. People are going to think we're out there in the another realm that they can't understand. But what do you care if you get the victory? If you get the victory, you're going to train somebody else how to get the victory. And so we are, we are those who are after the victory, and we really shouldn't care how it looks to somebody else. We should care for the win. Amen. We're going for the win. Amen. Amen. And so you have to discover for yourself what God has said about you. So there has to be boldness inside of you. There has to be a daring inside of you. There has to be a willingness to step out and... And to be strange to the mindsets of other people. Because the world does not think this way. But God's word is this way. So yesterday, a a friend of mine from St. Louis came. She was in between um, flights. So she just came to my house for like an hour and a half. But I happened to be the one who led her to the Lord a long time ago long time ago. So here's how that went. She worked down the hall from me, and uh, she came down to say hi and introduce herself. She was oh so cute. She had horses and long blonde hair, and she used to like do the barrel riding and don't ask me, all that stuff. Okay. She was so cute, but she said she wanted to go to lunch, so we went to lunch, and we became friends, and so I said to her, she told me all this. I didn't remember these exact words and stuff. And she said, you said, so, if you die today, are you going to go to heaven? She said, well, I'm Catholic. (laughs) And she said, well, she said, you said, well, that's really good. But do you know that if you die today, you're going to heaven? She goes, I don't know. Can you know that? And I said, yeah, you can be absolutely assured of that. And she goes, well, how would I know that? And I said, well, you have to really believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Ask him into your heart, and he'll come in, and then you will have eternal life through him, according to John 3, 16, 17, which I quoted to her. And she said, I was like, well, I want to know where I'm going when I die for sure. I don't want to hope. I, I want to know, so I'm not, I want to pray that. I said, all right, let's pray. So we prayed, and we became fast friends after that. And she said, she said you will never know. She goes, from that point on, my life ha- was transitioned, but she had to keep walking the walk, reading the word, speaking the word, and doing the word. But as she did, she became more and more and more victorious. And so now, God has given her land, and she has lots of horses, and she does weddings and stuff on her property. She's got a wonderful husband. She is winning in every area because she transitioned from not knowing who she was to knowing the God that created her and aligning herself to his will in her life. That is how it all works, is that champions have to begin somewhere. And they begin by acknowledging who the Lord is in their life. Number one, who is he and have you accepted him as Lord and Savior of your life? Then they have to get into his word and begin to agree and align themselves with the word. And then as you align yourself with the word, these things are no longer strange to you because you know the greatness of your God. Because you know how big he is and how little circumstances are. And whatever 
is in your heart to do and to accomplish, he does it through you, with you and through you. And so, who is a champion in this house? Come on. Everybody should raise their hand. If you're not a champion, at least be a conqueror. Be, be fighting for the win. Be looking for something to conquer. Maybe you have to conquer something in your own life. Maybe you're like Gideon who's hiding in the wine press when God comes to get him out. Maybe you're the person who is, who is afraid of what God might require of you. Maybe you're afraid of what the enemy will do to you if you rise into your position and maybe you're just sitting there going, I don't know. I don't know if this stuff works. I don't know if I can believe this. I don't know if I can do all this stuff. I think I'll just hide. Well, let me tell you something. If you hide, the enemy will find you. There is no hiding place from him because he will seek you out. And he has one job, and that is to kill, steal, and destroy you. He has... No sympathy for you whatsoever. If he can take you out of this world, he will take you out of this world. And he is after you. But so is God. Glory to the most high God. He has got bigger legs to run after you. He has got you in the palm of his hand. He has got all kinds of grace he's going to throw on you. He's just looking for the opportunity for you to recognize who he is and say, Lord, I want you to be in my life as Lord and as Savior. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And then he floods you with the knowledge of himself and you begin to start thinking like a conqueror. You're like, I don't know what that enemy thought he was doing trying to keep me in fear because I'm not living in fear. Fear is under my feet. So is poverty under my feet. So is sickness and disease under my feet. So is wrong relationships under my feet. So is everything else that he could think of. It is under my feet because I have been positioned and filled with the knowledge of God and he cannot take it from me unless I offer it up. Champions live with faith. They have faith thinking and they know the power of their words. They know that they don't have to stay in the natural, but they can do what other people can't do. And they don't have to apologize for it. They have courage and they step out. Do it afraid. It isn't about how big the fight is against you. It's about how big God is on the inside of you. Mm -hmm. Jesus said this, and I'm going to close with this. Jesus said these words to infuse us with hope. So get infused today. Like, infused. This is the stuff that keeps you alive. This. Okay. John 16:33, Passion Translation. These things I have spoken to you that you may have peace. The world is looking for peace. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. Oh yeah. But I have overcome the world. But you must be courageous for I have conquered the world. Glory to God. Conquered here, when he says he has conquered, it means filled with joy. Filled with joy. Because when Jesus won against the enemy, he was a happy camper because he knew he could pass it on to you. And so we are on the winning side. So then how many here today want to be conquerors? How many want to be champions? Amen. So, today, I declare over you the fact that God's DNA is already inside of you. That everything that has come against you already has a victory assigned to it. 
that there is nothing that the enemy can think of that God hasn't already defeated. And so I speak to the conqueror and the champion that is on the inside of you. And I say, you will arise. You will arise. And you will win. And you will enjoy the victory. And you will be the champion that God has called you to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, how many of you are going to apply any of this to your life? Oh, Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. I got hands. Oh, yes, yes, yes. God God brings the victory with agreement. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, I love you. But who loves you the most? And who loves them the most? All right, go tell somebody. (laughs) If you would like to support this ministry with a financial contribution, visit our website at www.LibertyLifeCenter.org. Find the link to the left that says Donate Now and follow the instructions there. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing worldwide through this ministry.